Well, now I'd like to introduce you to a tireless campaigner on behalf of women. Rona Hines is a senior associate with Democracy, which was established in the year 2000 with a number of aims, not least to increase the number of women in politics in Northern Ireland. She's a trusted figure on boards too numerous to mention, while her recent research and publications have explored in detail the impact the current economic crisis is having on women. Good morning. It's um, wonderful to be here to be addressing the issue of <coughs> excuse me, fair share and women's economic independence. I think we appreciate that we as women and our sisters have moved on. Uh, certainly women's position has improved, but I would suggest at this time the issue of women's economic independence is seriously under threat. Igniting the economy is a considerable challenge for the Northern Ireland executive. No e OECD member has more than 25% of people employed by the state, while Northern Ireland has more than 30%. However, the drive to rebalance the Northern Ireland economy from public to private sector, on top of the austerity response to the recession, will not affect women and men equally. Therefore, the Northern Ireland executives' intervention strategies are important. Women make up two-thirds of the public sector workforce and are likely to bear the brunt of job losses. Half of all employed women work in public administration, education and health services. Moreover, the preferred path to building private sector capacity is to focus on industries where the executive has identified a growth gap. These are heavily male. For example, the IT sector in which the executive is interested is the 80% of the workforce are men. The Department of Employment and Learning's biggest single strategy is its skills strategy. And Dell will need to rise to the challenge of gendering it effectively. The implications of downsizing the public sector are far-reaching. Women's terms and conditions of employment will be impacted. Public sector terms and conditions are more beneficial to women in terms of flexibility, leave, childcare, etc. Women are significantly underrepresented in the senior echelons of the civil service and local government, despite the advances we have made. In a shrinking public sector, there will be less opportunity for movement into senior positions to, to reverse this sufficiently. In turn, the inability to improve women's share of leadership positions has an effect on public policy making, not least in the economic field, where there are few senior female public servants. Our Minister uh, for Trade and Investment has indeed appointed a number of women to advisory boards, but we need senior women in the public service to match that in the economic field. Gender equality is not only about breaking the glass ceiling, it is about influence on the broader strategies and policies. The full-time gender pay gap has widened in Northern Ireland over the last year, and the difference in median earnings between the public and private sectors for women working full time is more than 200 pounds, more than 200 pounds from the public to the private sector. Northern Ireland is not out of line with public sector wages in Britain, so the problem is clearly one of private sector pay, which is lower than elsewhere at 82% of the UK average. The Women on the Edge research, published in mid-2011, reported that inquiries to the Equality Commission about equal pay had more than doubled in three years. As Michael mentioned earlier, in the underreported area of pregnancy discrimination, there were 510 inquiries to the Commission in the three years to 2010. In addition, every single advice agency, every single advice agency interviewed for Women on the Edge reported an increase 
in cases of pregnancy discrimination. As Nula Crilly said in the video, we, women are discriminated against in ways that are not always obvious or visible. Pregnancy discrimination is underreported. Keep pushing it the wrong way. It is widely acknowledged that women remain the largest underrepresented groups when it comes to enterprise, and Northern Ireland is far below the EU figure for women's entrepreneurial activity. As Tracy said, women represent a huge pool of untapped potential, and diversity is an incubator for greater creativity and innovation. However, in sufficient numbers, women will attract other women like magnets and bring cultural change in, in the economy. The Economist suggested, and it's quoted here, that women are the single biggest and least acknowledged force for economic growth on the planet, who have contributed more to the expansion of the world economy than either new technology or the emerging markets of China and India. We should be stressing that much more. A time of economic challenge presents an opportunity to the brave to take a different approach and build a different economic model. The women-led order capital in Iceland, which first ha um, uh, saw the financial collapse, their directors warned against the excessive risk-taking by financial institutions, and they heed two global trends. Firstly, the growing body of research that demonstrates that companies owned or managed by women yield a higher long-term return. And secondly, the growth opportunities in businesses that embrace values that enable them to turn social, ethical, and environmental responsibility to their business advantage. Halla Thomas, daughter of Odder, speaks without embarrassment of putting feminine values into finance to create a healthier and more balanced company with sustainable values at its core. The Labour Market Statistics Bulletin reported that for 2011-12 period, the number of females who had business plans improved by Invest Northern Ireland was 906, which represents 38% of the total approved. And Tracy gave us some concrete examples of very inspiring women. This is a hopeful sign, and more is needed by way of investment and support. Former Northern Ireland Institute of Directors Chair Joanne Stewart's top tip is that women need the right support and mentoring from outside their company. And important networks like women in business play a critical role. Historically, women have found it much harder than their male counterparts to access business startup loans. It is difficult to assess the extent of this as gender disaggregated statistics are not routinely gathered. Women are starting from a lower plateau of business development. And I want to take this opportunity of sharing the platform with Tracy to ask that Invest Nor Northern Ireland establish solid targets and monitoring for women's enterprise beyond participation in development programs. We need to know how many women-owned businesses are among Northern Ireland export companies, how many are encouraged to start businesses in priority areas for growth and investment here, how many are among the social economy enterprises? We need more research in Northern Ireland to find out exactly where women are, uh, how they are progressing, and how to drive and capitalize on women's talent. As Tracy said, fear of failure and appreciation of skills have been found to be barriers for women, but there are also structural problems which have not been properly explored. The structural and cultural issues that inhibit women from exercising their entrepreneurial talent must be tackled and a firm connection made between women entrepreneurs and the, economics, uh, and the executive's economic growth strategy. This is still a gap. Anna Bird, acting chief executive of the Fawcett Society, said that women are acting as shock absorber absorbers for the cuts bearing the brunt of job losses, reduced benefits, and the rollback of public services. Low-paid women workers in the health service can testify to this. Public sector efficiencies have reduced temporary and casual staff, 
and cut back on permanent and full-time staff hours. Nurses, domestics and catering staff, all overwhelmingly female, are affected. Work schedules changed, workloads increased, restrictions were placed on taking term time leave to look after children in school holidays in many places. More home helps were employed on zero hours contracts. The picture is the same in private sector employment with changes to terms and conditions of employment and increased unsocial hours in the, in the retail sector with pressure to accept or face a cut in hours. We discovered this through interviews for Women on the Edge. Workplace relations have been affected with women in, women in tighter competition with each other to get hours of work since 24 instead of 16 hours are needed to qualify for working tax credit. Women reported to Women in, on the Edge that they were distressed at the undermining of their working values, whether in standards of cleanliness are being permitted to give only 10 minutes of care to assist an elderly woman in her home with personal services. They felt helpless and disempowered. The Institute for Conflict Research found that migrant workers were without contracts of employment, earned below the minimum wage, worked excessive hours and had little or no holiday pay, sick pay or maternity pay. There was no risk assessment for pregnant women and poor health and safety standards. Lone parents face many challenges from both welfare reform and the obstacles to accessing employment. Successive research has shown that lone parents want to work. A study by Gray and Carraher has put the figure as high as 77%. They want secure employment with opportunities but often find their choices constrained by traditional assumptions about appropriate employment for them. They find they are, gendered, they are channeled into highly gendered, low-paid employment. Barriers for lone parents include availability and cost of transport. More than half do not own a car. And fitting travel and work around childcare responsibilities. Still Waiting, which captured the stories of young women showed they were considerably underrepresented in training schemes. While, while they are more numerous than men in mainstream FE courses, vocational training and apprenticeships are heavily skewed towards men. The Dell Minister's review of apprenticeships will need to come up with a number of priorities for women, as well as gender-proofing the strategy as a whole. Otherwise, many women will fail to find a foot, foothold on the pathway to employment. Moreover, if the apprenticeship and skills strategies are to feed into the economic priorities that the executive has have for growth, there must be a steady flow of women through the supply pipeline in order to rebalance these industries from 80% male, male to their fair share of women. Personal benefits are based on lifetime, pension benefits are based on lifetime earnings. Adrian Peltz will be concerned to learn of the considerable financial loss the lack of childcare represents to women graduates over their lifetime. Already in debt for student loans, times, time out of the labour market for child rearing cost them dearly, particularly in pension entitlements. The earnings of women graduates with a preschool child are on average only 44% of the earnings of childless women graduates, only 44%, with knock-on consequences for their pensions in later life. The median pension saving for a 56-year-old woman is six times lower than that of a man's. Few women on low pay or single earners, such as lone mothers, can afford to contribute to an occupational or personal pension. Women are twice as likely as men not to have made pension contributions, and then twice as likely to adjust them when they have children. Women's pension contributions are affected by the gender pay gap, by high levels of part-time work, time out of work for child and dependent care responsibilities, and changing patterns of domestic partnership. 
Divorced women, for example, are half as likely to have pension coverage. This is affected by their children's ages at the time of divorce. As a result of this, coupled with living longer than men, women are at much higher risk of older age poverty. The Northern Ireland executive can enhance or undermine women's economic independence by the choices they make in the design and implementation of two upcoming policies. The first is welfare reform, where women could be returned to a state of dependency what, that our mother saw, saw with the marriage bar that Michael uh, referred to earlier. The marriage bar prevented married women from working. Welfare reform not only returns the discredited head of household con uh, concept where the man controls the income, in this case paying it to the main applicant, it calculatedly disadvantages women. You will hear more on this from Lynn Carville later. The executive can and should take the no-cost policy decision that it will put some money into the woman's purse in the household by paying the benefit to the woman instead of the man if he is earning. The second is the unyielding problem of the lack of a flexible, accessible, affordable childcare infrastructure. It is a critical factor for lone parents as well as for other women and some men. Where a childcare place is to be found, a woman can hand over her full wage packet to pay for childcare. Over £1,000 a month for two children, one of them part-time, is not unusual. Many people are paying £1,400-£1,500 a month. I want to make a plea to the executive through the junior minister and the office of the first and the deputy first minister this morning that it listens to both the loud and the many silent voices of thousands of women who juggle employment and caring every day or who wish they could work. The executive's childcare strategy must be designed to maximize the economic participation of women, otherwise it is not an effective strategy. Northern Ireland can no longer afford to be left so far behind Britain, Ireland and the rest of Europe. Other countries that set out decisively to tackle this have achieved success. The law in Denmark requires the parents are given a place for each child within three months of demand. Denmark has reached a position where supply and demand for childcare are in balance. The Welsh Assembly Government sets a vision where childcare is to support economic growth and prosperity, national competitiveness, business productivity and individual social mobility. One of the Welsh strategy objectives is to support childcare enterprise, both in terms of commercial enterprise and social enterprise, and it identifies the need to improve the provision of childcare linked to parents' and carers' work patterns. Childcare and employment should be explicitly linked. Childcare for employment must be the framework for the executive strategy inside which provision for children's education and, and health would sit. Too often, our previous approaches to childcare have been to focus on children's education and health, and this is an underwhelming, underwhelming substitute for a strategy. There should actually be no competition for quality provision for children and absolute provision for women's right to work. The government should commit towards the goal of universal, good quality, accessible and affordable childcare for all children up to the age of 14. It may not all be delivered immediately, but we really need to be on this pathway. The problem of selecting a department or agency charged to lead on delivering childcare must be tackled. So far, we have no department that will take that responsibility. There should be a single minister and department with responsibility to lead and a statutory duty for childcare placed upon a government body. Supply stimulus is urgently required and Dell and Detty should be involved. Uh, like Wales, 
we should see the economic, the economic potential of childcare businesses in the private sector and the social economy sector, as well as with public sector provision. We are totally underdeveloped in this. The International Labour Organization Global Jobs Pact model has an explicit gender dimension and seeks to include women in the design and management of recession recovery packages. The European region of the UN Economic and Social Committee is concerned there is a risk of aggravating gender equality in the current economic and financial circumstances. This is certain to be a topic on the agenda of the CEDAW Committee in its examination of the UK, including Northern Ireland, in a few months' time, and Michael referred to that. The EU Equal Opportunities Committee reminded member states that they must stand by their international commitments. CEDAW, the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, explicitly calls upon state parties to address discrimination against women in the economic field. The International Labour Organization proposes that risk to gender equality should be included in risk audits to ensure gender disadvantage is avoided. There is also significant economic benefit from incorporating gender considerations into risk audit. Furthermore, there is evidence to suggest there are gendered differences in attitudes to risk. If there had been gender balance, if there had been gender balance in financial decision making, the economic meltdown may have been less likely. Men's total risk taking against women's more judged risk taking might have balanced the situation. I am certain that the nascent Northern Ireland Women's Budget Group stands ready to offer advice. Thank you.